If tomorrow starts without me There's something you should know While I hold you close, never let you go Hello and welcome to The Broken Pack, a podcast focused on giving adult survivors of sibling loss a platform to share their stories and to be heard, something that many sibling loss survivors state that they never have had. Sibling loss is misunderstood. The Broken Pack exists to change that and to support survivors. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Dean. In today's episode, you'll hear Heather's devastating story of losing her sister, Melissa, following complications after her pregnancy. You'll also hear how family dynamics have changed and some secondary losses and ambiguous losses that she discussed. Take a listen. Second guessing, cause you never know, you just never know. All right. Welcome, Heather. I was wondering how you wanted to introduce yourself to our listeners. I guess I'm Heather Mercer, and my husband and I just celebrated our 21st anniversary last week. And we have four boys, three that are biological, and I also have my sister's oldest son and both kinship arrangement. I homeschool all the boys. I homeschooled my children, since my oldest lives in kindergarten, he's now 14. And so I guess I should say the kids, our ages range between six and 14. And then my sister had moved in with us in 2021, and I started homeschooling her son shortly before she passed away. I have a degree in psychology, but I ended up working in financial services. Hmm. In the bro- brokerage area it was a complete <laughs> deviation from what my degree was. And I describe my family as a family of tinkers. We're always working on something or messing with something. I do a lot of colored pencil art and jewelry making. And my husband and I were working on restoring an Airstream, an independent Airstream. Uh, We Mm -hmm. started that back in 2016 before we had our youngest. And we had planned to travel on it for a while and find a, a Bought a land to do some homesteading, which we do a little bit here. We've, we've got it just under two acres. So I do a little bit of homesteading, no animals, though, much to my hmm. children's disappointment. We don't have chickens. <laughs> Are you in a rural area? It sounds like we're actually in a village, but we're like on the edge of the township. And then as soon as you hit the township, there's farmland. And so, yeah. The, at the end of the school year, they have a tractor parade for the high school that goes right past oh, your wow. house. Okay. Thank you for sharing all that. I'm just curious, like what state are you? Yeah, we're in Ohio. So Ohio. we're okay. in Northeast Ohio. Okay. And but we thought we were done with the snow and today we look like little snow globes. Yeah, we did too. Thank you for all of that. Before we talk about losing Melissa, what would you like our listeners to know about her? Okay. She was a single mom of two boys. Their ages were 10, and she had a newborn at the time of her passing in 2021. The newborn was premature by 13 weeks. He was four months out from his birthday, but he was premature by 13 weeks. He should have only just been born. She was a nurse in a nursing home, and it was a dream of hers. I just remember her being in first grade. You had to write out what you wanted. and. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to be when you grew up and she wrote out that she wanted to be a nurse. And then when she got into high school, she actually trained to become an on mechanic and <laughs> did that for a few years until she had her oldest son. You said auto mechanic? Auto mechanic, yep. She was trained to work on cars and did that for a little while. She loved animals, especially cats. We had a cat patches growing up that she was particularly attached to. She was a drummer in high school and at her funeral, a lot of friends from high school came and talked about her and that she was the only one that was able to teach them how to do the cadence, which is like a special song that introduces the marching band when you hear the cadence of the marching bands coming out onto the field. And lastly, she was a type 1 diabetic. She Hmm. was diagnosed at eight years old. So that was back in 93. And the expectations, uh, life expectancy for a type 1 diabetic at that time, the expectations for quality of life is a lot different than it is now. Mm -hmm. Um, And that we'll get into later on. 
So because she was type 1 diabetic, she was afraid to live alone. And she lived mm-hmm. with my parents. Like I said, she was a single mom. I'm going to sound like the Reba. She was a single mom. She worked two jobs. She also went to college because she was an LPN and she was going to become an RN. And after 2020, she had said, I'm 35 years old. I still live at home with my parents. I want to go out on my own and I, I want to become an adult. And so in 2021, she was pregnant with her youngest. She started looking for a place and it was really hard to find apartments. And we have in our home and in Law Suite and they moved in her and her boyfriend and her oldest and his son and then expecting that the baby would move in soon. They moved into the in-law suite, so at least she had some independence, but wasn't completely alone. And she wasn't alone with her boyfriend there either, but with someone that really understood her struggle with diabetes. Yeah. Were you older or younger? Uh, I'm older by four years. Okay. So you had Um, understanding of what her medical needs were. and Yeah. As a child, were you involved with her care, making sure? Yes. So I was 12 when she was diagnosed. And I remember late high school, college, you had to call in your, her blood sugar numbers to the nurse practitioner. And so I was on the phone with the nurse practitioner, giving her what Melissa's blood sugar numbers were, and then they make adjustments to her medication. She attended a camp out here in Northeast Ohio, Camp Home Dakota, which has a very special place for both of us. So right after she was diagnosed, they found a campership for her to be able to attend right away. And it's great for kids to attend there to learn how to manage their diabetes and how to do the finger pricks and see that there's other kids Mm -hmm. that have type 1 diabetes as well. She attended there and loved it. And it's just this really special place. And then when I was in high school, I had gone out with her to drop her off and was approached by the camp director. And he said, hey, we, we had a kitchen staff member quit and you're 15. We're curious, would you like to come and work here. And so I worked there for the next three summers. And it, like I said, it was just a really special place for both of us. A, a place that, you know, even now as an adult, like I had gone back and supported them and mm-hmm. they had the inspector come in. And so I came out and I mopped floors and I cleaned toilets and did all those things. Mm-hmm. And yeah, <laughs> if you send me the link to that, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. So that yeah. Listeners can support that or find out more. What was your relationship like with her? So I'll take it back a little bit. My parents were married for 13 years before they had kids. So they were in their mid-30s and the 80s to be in your mid-30s and have kids. That was just really unusual. My dad was a Vietnam vet, so that contributed to it. And then my mom ended up struggling with infertility and had a couple miscarriages. And so I was born when she was 35. And then I remember being three, four years old and praying with my mom for a little brother or sister. And Mm -hmm. Melissa was born when I was four and I was really proud of her and really excited. And that little mama thing, Mm -hmm. not one of the pictures I sent you where I was taking a nap with her, that was pretty Mm -hmm. consistent. And then when we got into school age, especially when she got into school age, I don't have a whole lot of memories other than us dressing up for Easter or Christmas and going to my uncle's big thing. But it was really like once she was in high school that I have more memories and especially high school through adulthood. When we were in high school, my mom got a job outside the home for the first time in years. And I was a college student and because she was type 1 diabetic, and my mom was working as she worked in a factory. So it was like she could just take a phone call. So that mm-hmm. laid them in my lap to carry a cell phone around with me. Um, Melissa tried skipping school and I got a call on the cell phone. And of course, this is like early 2000s and cell phones weren't very popular. And I just remember my teacher being really upset that I took this call and got up and walked out of class. And I had to come back and explain to her, I'm really sorry. I've got a younger sister that I'm responsible for and I can't skip this call. So, yeah a protector, a, an overseer, a little mama thing. And much I it respected that she was her own person and that I wasn't her mother, but I was definitely always looking out for her. Yeah. It sounds like that carried through with her living with you as well. Yeah. How did your relationship change after you were adult? 
Not a whole lot. I remember when she told me that she's pregnant with her oldest, I was really upset because again, like I said, the expectation, it, it, we were told always growing up, it'd be, we'd be lucky if she saw it to, to be a teenager. We'd be lucky if she saw herself to adulthood. We'd be absolutely amazed if she had a baby. And so when she told me that she had a baby, the movie Fried Green Tomatoes, where Julia Roberts' character passes away, that was running through my head. And I was really upset and really concerned for her. But she carried him full term and mostly everything was all right. And once she had her oldest, we did a lot of life together because I had my 14-year-old. So and then her son are two years apart. They were interested in each other. And so we would do Zoom trips and get together and go to the Lego store and then go see Santa at Christmas. And because she lived with my parents, was, you know, just always going to visit grandma and grandpa or they would come to our house for the holidays. And so we did a lot of life together, even though we lived an hour and a half apart. And mm-hmm. when she moved in with us, our expectation was that we were going to do a lot more life together. Mm-hmm. How long before she died did she move in with you? She moved in August 1st and she passed away September 25th. So So not less than So you weren't able to do life together. And most of that time she had just returned to work, which I thought was really unfair. She had a C-section. She had a baby in the NICU and she went back to work at the eight week mark, I think, Mm. and had to fight with the system for extended leave and that was one of the phone calls that I handled after she passed away was talking to them because they kept calling the weaving messages. A lot of that time that she was here, even in those two months, she was working a full-time job and attending to a newborn in the NICU. Right. Um, and I will say here that the father did not want to put in the effort of learning how to do some of the medical things. And so it created some issues for the your tr- nephew it, or for her help? It created some issues with the NICU. They did not like that and were hesitant to send the baby home. That sounds challenging for everyone involved. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. she passed away when he was four months old. They were just starting to talk about sending him home. And she passed away. And like I said, we had had to cut off contact for safety reasons with his father. And I heard through the grapevine that the baby didn't come home until January, which would be nine months. Mm. Maybe my math's wrong. <laughs> Seven yeah. months. And I don't know a whole lot of people that have babies that aren't like you, but I know a couple and extended stays are typical, especially if they see the slightest thing, but this situation was especially extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Sounds like it was a rough period for multiple reasons, obviously. What are you comfortable sharing about losing Melissa? We'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Dean, host of the Broken Pack podcast. If you've lost a sibling, you viscerally understand the complexity of your loss and how isolating it can feel. Sibling loss is misunderstood. And that's why I created an in-person retreat called the Sibling Grief Refuge. It's happening this August 15th through the 18th near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This retreat will include grief-focused activities and sessions curated and facilitated by compassionate grief experts, including me. It's a space where your grief, your loss, and your sibling will be honored and understood. In addition to grief discussions, education, support, and togetherness, you will be tapping into your continuing bond with your sibling through multiple activities, such as going on a photo walk or sensory exploration and mindful walks. In our remembrance ceremony, you'll have further opportunity to honor your sibling, share your story, and hear about others' siblings. For more information, visit thebrokenpack.com forward slash retreat, or just head to thebrokenpack.com and click the sibling loss retreat link in the top menu. Spaces are limited, so secure your spot today. Let's walk this path of sibling grief together. Now back to the show. It it was weird because we, like I said, we were prepped throughout her entire life that she was a walking miracle. So I'll back up again. 
when she was a baby, she was 15 months old and she was diagnosed with meningitis and spent some time in the hospital. And that's one of like my earliest memories is that I was four and I went to stay with my grandparents and then with my aunt and uncle. My dad had a job that he traveled a couple of states away pretty much weekly. And well, and so my mom was with my sister at the hospital and then she developed asthma and it was severe and then diabetes on top of that. And especially around the holidays, the excitement of Christmas seemed to kick off. The excitement of Christmas, she always complained about the cinnamon pine cones at the grocery store. The cinnamon, the smell of the cinnamon <laughs> pine cones, bringing the Christmas tree down with all the dust and stuff triggered an asthma attack in her. And then the asthma attack would trigger the medicines would make her blood sugars run all over the place. And then mm-hmm. she'd end up at Christmas in the the children's hospital. Like tr- more every, than one Almost year. every year. Yeah. Oh, almost well. every year. We were prepped in a way. Like you never expect a 36-year-old to just suddenly die, but we were prepped in a way. And then in 2018, so she would have been 33, she had a heart attack. She'd been very sick and she was trying to, finish her finals. And she actually went camping with us while she was sick and came home from that and went to the hospital. And they were like, you have pneumonia. And while she was at the hospital, she had a heart attack. Oh. So that led to her having some discussions with me about her oldest son. And if anything ever happened to her, it's her desire that he would go into our care. And his father is living, but do not assume that just because a parent is living that they're a healthy individual or capable of caring for a child, especially to have a parent say that this is my express desire. As the legal guardian, she was the only one that had the legal whatever established. It After sounds that, like she had decision making custody solely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. They never went to a, an official capacity with that, but in the state of Ohio, she because she was single. She was solely the decision maker unless father filed for something that never happened until she passed away. She had that discussion with me. You always knew it was on the horizon. You didn't expect it to happen when she was 36. We had the discussion. My parents, again, are aging. They're middle to late 70s. And because she was a nurse, she talked about that she would take a caregiving role for them. And I would support her however way I could. That was a really scary thing that she's mm-hmm. no longer there. And I just lost my mom in May. And I'm sorry. That was that was one of those situations where I wish I would have had the medical knowledge that Melissa did uh, and mm-hmm. been able to ask questions about things because it was a really intense six weeks going from my mom thinking she had, having a gallbladder attack to she has stage four pancreatic cancer and she was delusional in the end. It was hard to watch and to do alone. Yeah. But the actual losing Melissa, like you said, I, I felt prepped for it. It was obviously devastating at first. Now two years out, it's there are so many things that she left behind that need to be tended to that are a big mess and very stressful. And the custody situation with her oldest is definitely number one. And that was two years of court stuff and very intense. And now I have her son who's going to be a preteen and is dealing with some trauma stuff himself, and rightly Mm -hmm. so, for losing his mother. And probate, because she was an auto mechanic, she had tons of vehicles in her name. And because she has two children, and she was never married. Everything goes with the kids. And even though we're doing probate, we can't make a whole lot of decisions mm-hmm. without the court's direction. My dad kept talking about when his dad died, it was just so easy. He just went down to the courthouse and he did this and he filled out this form. Now, mm-hmm. two years in with probate and it's just really slow going and really frustrating. It sounds like with her children being minors too, it's yeah. not just they can go down to the courthouse because they're minors. She had a lot of stuff. And she Mm -hmm. held on to a lot of stuff and kind of pockets of time throughout the house. And my parents looked back and said, you know, how did we end up with all the stuff in the house? You don't realize it until the person's gone. But we were filling our cars by the carload and making donations to women's centers and donating stuffed animals to the sheriff or children. 
and I'm not sure if it was for children that were in CPS or uh, Child Protective Services. And there's still just a lot more. I think a lot about, they talk about when you passed away, somebody's eventually going to have to go through your underwear drawer and through your things. And how much do you want to really leave for them to have to go through? And I was more on the minimalist side, even before she passed away and more so since she passed away, Mm -hmm. just simplify as much as I can. Yeah. Do you want to share how she died? So the day she died, it was September and the end of the the season for our garden. And I was out working on that and pulling stuff up. And we were sitting down and her boyfriend came flying around the house and screaming. And he said, I think she's dead. And we we're like, who? And he was like, Melissa, I think she's dead. He was like, I already called the emergency team. And so my husband went down to just confirm and he came back and he was like, yeah, I think so. I just remember it was like the longest wait of my life waiting for the EMS team to go in and assess and actually officially tell me that she had passed away um, and that it was not just some misunderstanding that maybe she was in a coma or something, her mm-hmm. blood sugar was low or whatever. I remember watching the paramedic come out and go into the truck and I walked over to her and I was like, please, she's my sister. And she's, I just needed my job. And I was like, I understand that, but she's my sister. I'm not just nobody. Please just tell me. And of course she just very patiently told me that I need to go sit down, which sucked. But, and then they came over and they talked to me and they asked about her medical history and just, you know, confirmed that she had passed away. At that point, it was really hard to, to tell. They can make some suggestions. But of course, there needed to be an autopsy if you really wanted to know. And at this Mm -hmm. point, after they confirmed, I was trying to call my parents. And I called my parents' house a number of times and they hadn't answered. My nephew actually was at their house for the weekend. And he said he he saw my number come up. And my dad was just like, well, we'll deal with it later. They were in the middle of doing something. And so finally... My mom had a cell phone. My dad doesn't, but my mom had a cell phone. I kept trying to call her on that. I couldn't get a hold of her. So I knew she was supposed to be with her church group and I ended up calling her pastor. And I was like, hey, Melissa died. I couldn't even. Couldn't soften that. Yeah, couldn't soften that. I was like, I'm trying to get a hold of my parents. She's My mom's supposed to be there with you guys. I just, I can't get a hold of her. And she she didn't come today. I'll send one of the members over to your parents' house. And so she sent one of the members over and he met my dad at the door and informed him that my sister had passed away and then my dad called me and he was like what is he telling me and I was like she passed away and they found her in the bathroom they found her in the bathroom they thought she'd gotten up to go to take a shower and actually the boyfriend's little three-year-old found her and then because she was in my house I'm dealing with the county examining what is it (laughs) the medical examiner medical examiner yeah yeah dealing with them they want to know where to send the send her who to call and so at this point I made contact with my mom and because I, I, I had no idea even who was out there by them so called them waited a long time because they had to drive an hour and a half to come out mm. and then after that I just remember trembling like I couldn't stop shaking definitely like in shock and I have my three sons and then her boyfriend's three-year-old there and they need to be fed and they need to be cared for and there's phone calls to make I ended up calling the the NICU and telling them that she had passed away because like you said there were some issues with baby had a special tube for eating that they needed to be trained and and the boyfriend was hesitant to he just wasn't comfortable with doing it or at least that's what he said he wasn't comfortable in learning how to do that and so he was just hoping that the baby would age out of it before he left the NICU. Mm-hmm. So they they were on watch with the NICU. And so I just wanted them to know that if Melissa didn't show up, this was why. Not because she's being negligent, but because, you know, she, she, she can't. She can't. Mm-hmm. And that, that was the other thing. She wasn't being negligent before she passed away. She worked and worked full time. And that's hard. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I can't imagine how hard that is. So after discussing with the medical examiner, her history, 
and discussing with my parents about do we do an autopsy or not. It was just determined that because she had a previous heart attack and because she had type 1 diabetes, which just added stacked on top of that. The reason she had the baby in the NICU, she had him 13 weeks early, was that she had preeclampsia. And after she had him, it was not resolving well. And so it was just an assumed that it was a heart attack. Again, we would have had to do some sort of autopsy to, to really determine that and just we didn't want to do that. And that's interesting that Ohio law wouldn't require that. I know here and when my brother died, they required an autopsy given the age. I know that the medical examiner didn't want to sign off on things at first. He said we should contact your primary care physician and ask them to sign off on it. Because she was pregnant and because of the nature of her pregnancy was so high risk, her primary care physician hadn't seen her within a certain, the allotted amount of time. And so I actually reached out mm-hmm. to the OB. Um, he was a high-risk OB and managed her case wonderfully. He was just a really fantastic doctor and just talked to him about what had happened. And you know, he confirmed that if you have a heart attack or you have heart issues or continue to have high blood pressure for a certain time past postpartum, then it can contribute to a heart attack and considered preeclampsia related. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. That sounds just awful. And you're trying to take care of all the kids in process. Yeah. That you just lost yeah. your sister. A couple of things with the baby was that we we're still under COVID rules with the hospital. What year was this? 2021. Yeah, okay. And because it was NICU related, the only people that were allowed to go see the baby were mother and father. And then siblings, two weeks before she passed away, the siblings, so my nephew, my oldest nephew, and then the boyfriend's three-year-old went with them, but they were not able to actually hold him or you know do anything with him. The, a nurse actually came behind a glass window and held him up and then mm-hmm. took him back. The baby was just a, a complete mythological character to, you know, my nephew. Mm-hmm which we've discussed a number of times. He knows he has a brother and yet he he knows nothing of them. So that kind of contributed to some of the trauma stuff that we've dealt with him. When I called the NICU and informed them it also had passed away, they granted me a one-time pass that I could go and see him and hold him. And I got to go up there and hold him. Going back to my sister being in the hospital with meningitis, my mom talked a lot about there were songs that she sang to Melissa to calm her because she was mm-hmm. just hysterical and in pain in the hospital. So that's been this tradition that's been passed down with our children is that you go and you see your baby in the hospital and you hold the baby and you sing the song. Melissa had done that with my youngest. She actually showed up 10 minutes after he was born and then she stayed <laughs> with me. My mom and my sister wanted to be there for the birth. They showed up 10 minutes after and that I got a chance to do that for her baby and sing to him and they let me give him a bath and feed him a bottle. And and then after that, his father went from not being involved to you're not taking my baby, which was never our intent, but that was in his mind what mm-hmm. we were doing. So he blocked all communication with the hospital mm-hmm. for us. We, yes, yes, it was very chaotic and just, I don't know if I said it, but For safety reasons, we stopped all contact because it just escalated from there. And he lived in our house. He went back out by my parents. His mom lived out there as well. He went back home and he would come back and grab some things and then go back. And so he was in and out. Melissa's funeral was two weeks after she passed away. So after the funeral, he officially moved out. He talked Mm -hmm. to us about staying longer and he, he didn't have a job and already had a history of not paying rent where he was previously and you can stay limited time mm-hmm. stay to get your feet but we're going to put a time limit on it and so he cut it short we shouldn't have doubt actually. so you have this ambiguous loss too you lost your sister and then by ambiguous loss you're mourning someone that's either physically present and psychologically absent or psychologically absent and physically present 
basically you're grieving your nephew that you saw one time as well. And like you said, yeah. mythical and creature. I hope that one day, and obviously I would assume he's going to be an adult when mm. that one day mm. happened, but that one day we will make a connection with him and that his heart wouldn't be hardened towards us. Because I can just imagine, based off the interactions that we had with his dad, that there could be a lot of things that were said that were negative. Yeah. And not true. Yeah. I took pictures when I went to see him at the hospital. I had started to write in a journal and it was just too much. I still have the journal. Maybe I'll fill it in. Yeah. Um, but right now it's too much. To fathom. How are you doing with your grief now? So throughout the two years that I was in the custody battle, it was very much held on pause. I couldn't attenuate to it because I had to attenuate to this very insane custody arrangement and fight, really. And after the custody stuff was finally agreed upon, I did okay. And we're mixing into this that I also lost my mom, lost the two key female figures in my life. My family mm-hmm. of origin was just my parents and my sister and I. And so now mm-hmm. it's just me and my dad. About October, so it's when I came home from the, the custody thing is when I wrote into you. Because I had friends that were very supportive and I could talk to, but I needed to tell the story a little bit in a more official capacity. And mm-hmm. I needed to say it that day. I was like running on adrenaline. Mm-hmm. And then that adrenaline crashed out. And so by October, I crashed out and I was looking at Thanksgiving and Christmas. So this would be the second Thanksgiving without Melissa, second Christmas without Melissa, and the first without my mom. I burnt out and I realized I was in a trauma mode. It was traumatizing both the loss of and traumatizing how Melissa died and just how suddenly it, it happened. And so... I spent a lot of the winter working on that burnout and working my stress and mm-hmm. anxiety and trauma. And I'm starting to come out of it, starting to feel like I can go and do things. I can I can talk about stuff and not completely break down. Therapy is a lot with that to be able to to talk that out loud. <laughs> um, my husband is amazing and he's supportive. And But the great thing about talking to a therapist is you can say things that and you don't have to look at that person over the dining room table over mm-hmm. dinner. Yeah. And you say awful things and they're not like really meant, but you think them sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that's normal. And it doesn't mean that you really feel that way about your person or, you know. Right. But there there was a period of time where I didn't have anything good to say. And I didn't want to say those bad things. And I didn't want to be angry and frustrated and, or let other people know that I was angry or frustrated with the situation. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there was a big mess <laughs> and yeah. and we were, my dad and I were left to clean it up. And my mom did a lot of work yeah. two years in between, but it's still a big mess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is the benefit of therapy. People say things in here that they wouldn't say elsewhere. It sounds to me like what you were also saying is that you delayed your grief. And you had to be somewhat focused on how things ended for such a long period of time. How are you with that now? Are you able to think about her differently? There are things I absolutely miss. Holidays are never going to be the same. Where I was talking about every Christmas, she was in the children's hospital. As an adult, the way she handled holidays and celebrations as she always made it big. So Christmas Mm -hmm. was always a big to-do for her. And Easter, and she loved to dress up. And, you know, for Halloween, she loved to do those things. I didn't really feel like doing Christmas. I didn't really feel like doing holidays. And, of course, I've got these kids. And I don't want to ruin the magic of it for them. So we kept things very simplified. But it was really hard and to even think about getting together with family, getting together with my dad. That, That felt awful that... He was alone on Christmas, and, but it was like I couldn't even get myself up. I couldn't, 
I could get dressed and I could get showered and I can do those things now, but I definitely couldn't do it then. I think about the things that she's missing out with her son. Like I said, he's gonna, he's a preteen now. He's going to be a teenager this year. My oldest, who's 14, just asked me about driving and she's never going to get to teach him how to drive. Or, mm-hmm. And so there, there are those things that I miss. They don't make me feel devastated anymore. Definitely, you know, that they're missing. It's like you keep looking for her, mm-hmm. but you know that she's not there. She's not chilling out. Yeah. Do you avoid that part of the house at all? Uh, no, I'm actually down here right now. Oh. After she passed, yes, absolutely. I did not want to come downstairs. And it helped that her boyfriend was down here and that he didn't want us down here. Her son. So we're a three-bedroom house, one bathroom. And so you've got six people living in that this one house mm-hmm. and there is a bathroom in the apartment and so you know sometimes you have to tell the kids go downstairs if somebody mm-hmm. else is in the bathroom go downstairs and he will not he will not come down here. Mm-hmm. i'm glad that you also said he's getting help too yeah yeah is there anything that you found surprising around sibling loss or support either right after she died or now I had a really great community and I knew that going in. It it was just crazy to me. I, my house was like a train station. I just had people constantly coming and going and then losing my mom. It's been the complete opposite. I haven't really seen anyone. And it, part of that was that we actually packed ourselves up in our camper and went and lived out there through the six weeks the end of my mom's life and so some friends said they didn't even realize that we were back yet or and I guess that one of the surprising things is that I have reconnected with some friends from high school that they were good friends then I'm actually just really terrible at keeping in contact with people and they keep reaching out and checking on me over the the past two and a half years Mm mm-hmm because I'm not living in the town where I grew up, nobody really knew my sister. She wasn't here long mm-hmm. enough for them to know. So, you know, I'd go into town and I knew I looked wrecked. Uh, you know, we live in this little village and I would go into the butcher and I just looked wrecked. And somebody would say, hey, you know what's going on? And I'd have to explain myself and explain, you know, my sister just died. Sometimes you hope that the rumor meal <laughs> is, is, is as close to me as it can be, but sometimes there, there'd be someone where I'd have to talk about it. And so that was hard, especially in the beginning. I personally, I've had a lot of losses. I had two second trimester miscarriages. My husband lost his dad 10 years ago to cancer. And so I've always been really open. If somebody mm-hmm. asked me, I just told them just, there was no sense in trying to make myself look okay or seem okay. I just found it was better to be honest and mm-hmm. say what happened. I think that's great advice. I'm sorry for all, all of your loss. It's interesting because in some ways you anticipated her death for a very long time. And of course, it was still very shocking and surprising. Again, you don't expect at 36 that somebody's not going to be there anymore. And right. especially 36, new baby you expect that they're going to be there and get to see their kids grow up. So what are some of your favorite memories with Melissa? We lived next door to our cousins and uh, growing up and until I graduated high school and the movie Annie and could just come out mm. and we would reenact Annie and Melissa was the youngest of the five of us. And so she always got assigned the role of Sandy, the dog. Oh, the dog. Sandy the dog. Sandy the dog, because she was like two, you know, she couldn't really (laughs) say anything. I was asking my kids and my husband their memories too. So my kids always remember they they brought up going to the Lego store with her. And this is, this was tied in with Christmas. And so it was a big thing. And she always made sure that they got the mini figures and they always got to do the pick a brick and they always, just everything. It was just this big to do for her. But my husband and I wrote this down myself and then laughed when I asked my husband what his memory was, is early in our marriage. So 
my husband and I got married uh, in our early 20s. And so Melissa was 17. She was a junior in high school. And she'd come over and hang out with us. And so I took her and my husband grocery shopping with the one day. And they were walking around with like Walmart or something, clucking like chickens <laughs> while I'm trying to grocery shop. <laughs> and so, so I pretended I didn't know them and I went out of my business. But it, this carried on for a very long time that they kept clucking like chickens. And they, both her and my husband, just really enjoy making people laugh. And um, mm-hmm. so it, it was pretty par for course. We shared trips to the zoo. We would meet up there. It was a halfway point for us. And she'd bring my mom and we just walk around with the kids. I realized that my youngest, because he was born in 2017, he was just too young to remember anything pre-COVID, any of those trips pre-COVID. And then now that's just something I'm not interested in taking the kids and doing myself. And he looked at me and goes, Mom, I haven't even seen a giraffe. I was like, yes, you did, but you were like six months old. We would do that. I mentioned she wanted to be there for the birth of my youngest child. It was very special. I, I had advocated for myself to have a be back, which is a vaginal birth after mm-hmm. C-section. I actually had two C-sections prior. So I had the same doctor that she had when she gave birth to her youngest. And he was just fantastic in managing high, hard cases. It went from I was not laboring at all to I suddenly was matching a room over where the lady was like ready to give birth. It was Mm. so strange. Like our charts were matching each other. And then they had to call him and and they my mom and sister called my husband and they were like, hey, we're getting out in the parking lot. He said, the baby will be here by the time you make here. And that was pretty typical for my mom and my sister. They were late for everything. They'd (laughs) call me, they'd say, I'm on the way. It's an, an hour and a half to my house and three hours later, they're finally there because they had to multiple stops to pick up things that mm-hmm. they remembered on the way. We, all of our kids are May, June babies. So we mm-hmm. just would do this big joint celebration and we would never really do a big birthday party, but we made sure we all had cake together and mm-hmm. open presents and stuff. The, those are the highlights. I remember getting her ready for, I believe, prom. And the dress that she wore to prom was the bridesmaid dress for my wedding. Hmm. Mentioned she was a drummer in high school, the Margie Man stuff and the uniform. She went to the high school of our hometown. So it was a big to-do for her to be in band. And the band was honorary. P- people enjoyed the band. Mm-hmm. Where most places, band's kind of a bunch of geeks. <laughs> or was. <laughs> Do you find ways that you stay connected with her now? Obviously through the kids, but yeah. <laughs> she loved clothes. And mm-hmm. I find that where I was a little bit more, not prints or not loud colors or whatever, I'm adding mm-hmm. those things a little bit more. Mm-hmm. My glasses, I picked a pair of ridiculous looking glasses that I wouldn't have typically chosen. The ones you have on? Uh, yes, they have flowers in the frames, which before oh. I would only get like a plain and then my, I have driving glasses because I have really terrible night vision. And those are like bright red and polka dots. And my kids said <laughs> they look like mini mouse. And I was like, but I wanted the most ridiculous pair. Her name, Melissa, means honeybee. And I'm just really drawn to things that have honeybees mm-hmm. on them. My neighbors have bees. So we end up with honeybees in our yard all the time. I always look at you. And then the earrings that I'm wearing are were hers. They're honeybee earrings. And so I just added things in the way that I dressed that I would have gone with plain hoops or whatever. And now I've got little donut earrings in letting that side of her shine through me. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing so much about her and and your loss. And I really enjoyed our conversation as well today. I appreciate that you do. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Our theme song was written by Joe Millwood and Brian Dean and was performed by Fuji Sounds featuring Millwood. If you would like more information on The Broken Pack, go to our website, thebrokenpack.com. Be sure to sign up for our newsletter, Wild Grief, and to learn about opportunities and receive exclusive information and content, as well as grieving tips for subscribers. Information on that, our social media, and on our guests can be found in the show notes wherever you get your podcasts. Please like, follow, rate, subscribe, and share. Thanks again. You never know, you just never know.